before we start, I'd like you to ask yourself something. Do you believe in destiny? Are our lives written in the stars? Can two people be meant for each other? As little boys and girls, many of us imagined relationships as riding off into the sunset with a knight in shining armor, as the princess waking up to true love's first kiss. As a teenager, even, I remember riding into town with my grandpa, him telling me the story about how he and my grandma met. He ended with some remark about how he was really happy that he was with her and that he had met her, but that he sure he would have found somebody else if he hadn't. Now, don't get me wrong, this story was super sweet, but that whole time I was thinking, whoa, Grandpa, you mean you don't think she's the one? And I'm probably not the only person who have had a thought like this. According to a 2011 survey, 73% of Americans believe in the idea of soulmates, or that two people can be destined to be together. For those of us under 30, this increases to 80%. And just so you know, there's no significant difference between the number of men and the number of women that believe this. Overall, the idea of having a soulmate is one of comfort. It tells us that no matter how hard it gets, no matter how many times we've gotten dumped, there's someone out there looking for us, waiting for us, like we are looking and waiting for them. Someone who can maybe fill an emptiness within us or complete us somehow. But comfort isn't what we need on this one. Believing in soulmates is, at best, arguably unrealistic, and at worst, definitely detrimental. The most ironic part is that believing in soulmates can actually prevent us from finding and maintaining good relationships. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. How soulmates are kind of ruining romance. Now, let's start at the beginning. Where did this idea even come from? If you've read Plato's The Symposium, then you know that, according to Plato at least, soulmates have existed for as long as humankind has. In this old Greek myth, humans first existed as androgynous creatures with four legs, four arms, and two faces. That is, until Zeus, fearing their power, splits them in half, sending them eternally searching for their other. And thus, the idea was planted. We are meant to find our true loves and spend happily ever after together. Our one goal in life was to find a partner. This story, while it might not seem like it at first, also tells us that we can only be happy if we are happily in love. That being single is a bad thing. Now, some of you might dismiss this as just a story, and an old one at that, but you've seen the numbers, and it's clear that most of us still, be still believe in this, or at least think something similar. Fast forward to modern day. Research has shown that 94% of young people will look to television and 90% to movies for advice and information on love while only 33% will turn to their mothers and fathers, a measly 17%. Now, what do these things tell us? Movies, TV, and media in general. Well, as kids, we watch Cinderella, where the prince searches far and wide for the woman he knows he's meant to be with. Online, we scroll past post after post of couples comparing their relationships to Romeo and Juliet, two star-crossed lovers who would rather die than be without each other. Before watching YouTube videos, we're barraged with ads from dating sites that want to help us find not only a date, but our perfect match. Clearly, this idea is inescapable in our society, and one of the reasons the idea has stuck around so long and even thrived in the modern era is because of its popularity and prevalence in the media. But why is this an issue? Why should I or any of you care if somebody wants to believe that they have some destined romantic partner out there? Before I talk to you about how believing in soulmates can negatively affect our relationships, I want to clarify something. Throughout this talk, when I say believing in soulmates, what I'm really talking about is believing in something called romantic destiny. This includes not only believing in soulmates, but romantic destiny also means believing that potential relationship partners are either compatible or they're not, or believing that relationships that don't start off well will inevitably fail. 
or believing that unsuccessful relationships were never meant to be. This last statement, I think, is particularly relevant to many of us. After all, how many of us have either heard or said ourselves, it just wasn't meant to be? The phrase itself has become somewhat of a coping mechanism for us. Not happy with how things didn't work out? Oh, don't worry, they weren't supposed to. There's some soulmate out, for, out there for you. Someone bigger and better than the, than the last guy. This is somewhat of a positive outlook, but it's not how we should be thinking. We should be embracing our soulmateless selves. Let's get down to it. How does believing in soulmates negatively affect our relationships? I'm going to talk to you about how it affects us both while we're looking for a soulmate and for our relationship, as well as once we're in a relationship. So, let's start at the beginning of our journey. Let's say we're in the dating scene. We're on the prowl. And for the record, I think that on the prowl is a very fitting phrase, because we usually have a specific target in mind. We might even have a sort of mental checklist that covers everything we're looking for in a partner. Or it might not be so mental. If you Google dream man list, you'll come up with over 279 million results. Of course, millions of these lists are perfectly reasonable with items like has a job or won't wet willy my mom at Christmas dinner. <laughs> On the other hand, millions of these lists do contain up to and even over 100 items ranging from seemingly reasonable to creepily specific. Among them are nice voice, kind of raspy, sensitive, but not too sensitive, will wear plaid well, and my favorite, tries to secretly smell your hair, but you always notice. <laughs> A lot of us will laugh or maybe cringe at these list items because they're weird. We might even get the innate sense that looking for something that specific in a partner and that sort of just weird is a little bit unhealthy, and it is. However, even keeping a relatively normal list can be problematic. Having a list causes us to objectify our partners and pass up possibly suitable candidates because they don't have every single one of the qualities we imagine our soulmate would have. Sometimes when we're meeting someone for the first time or when we're swiping through Tinder, we're not seeing people with their own dreams, fears, and flaws, but we're seeing a product, something that either meets our standards or doesn't. Now, something that might be mixed up with making a list, but is distinctly different, is identifying your deal breakers. Laying down what we will and won't tolerate in a relationship and in a partner is not only fair, but important. Everyone's going to have a different deal breaker. Someone might say, for example, I'll never date another girl who complains about my friends. Or, I just don't date smokers. Having said that, you need to know where to draw the line. If you're going over some post-date debriefing with your friends, for example, and you say, oh, they were great, except they put anchovies on their pizza, then you might be putting too much emphasis on your list. Now, not only can things like these and having a list in general make us pass up fantastic candidates, but research has shown that the things we look for in a partner aren't usually the things that actually make us attracted to or compatible with someone in real life. As much as we drool over our celebrity crushes, I've had to consider the possibility that, no, <laughs> Zoe Deschanel and I might just not have that spark <laughs> if we ever meet. So even if you think you know what you want or what you don't want in a relationship, Having a list can end up being a bunch of items that, while they look drool-worthy on paper, don't do anything for you in real life. So what's our solution? We'll have one more workshop after this. It's me, you, in the back. We're going to ceremoniously burn these lists. <laughs> but let's zoom ahead in our journey. Let's say we've found our partner, 
the quest is over and we're ready to live happily ever after. Or not. Relationships are a little bit more complicated than that. Especially for those of us who believe in soulmates, relationship satisfaction in particular is a tricky subject. For us, relationship satisfaction later on in a relationship is highly dependent on relationship satisfaction early on, which can be high or low. For that reason, we'll look at two cases, the prince and the frog. So, dating a frog can take many shapes. But one way that it's really easy to have low relationship satisfaction, especially when you believe in soulmates, is your partner not matching up with your idea of the perfect guy or girl. If you cheated and didn't burn your list, then even if you decide to give someone a chance, despite them not meeting all of your criteria, these unchecked list items can come back to haunt you. For example, if we decide to settle and date the guy who put anchovies on his pizza, we might a little bit later on in the relationship start thinking, oh, this is a really great guy, truly. But I just can't get over the fact that he puts anchovies on his pizza. I mean, I think that really, there's someone out there meant for me that just prefers pineapple. <laughs> While this is a little bit of a weird example, small things like these can cause us to second guess our relationship choices and result in what some might call a premature breakup. But let's say you really did burn your list. Or maybe you never had a list in the first place. This is a great start. Now the next hurdle we have to jump when it comes to believing, with, believing in soulmates is the associated belief that being with a soulmate should be effortless. This belief is why we hear about so many couples breaking up after the first fight. To them, fighting means, hey, this person isn't my soulmate, because soulmates don't fight, right? This can also lead to a breakup. Clearly, issues big or small, if they happen early on in a relationship, usually just lead to plain old-fashioned termination. But let's look at our next case, the prince. That sounds hopeful, right? A prince? This is someone who we've gone through the whole honeymoon phase with. We've managed to avoid relationship issues until a little bit later on. And hey, that might sound like a godsend. I mean, I'm up here telling you that relationship satisfaction later on is based on initial relationship satisfaction, so if that was high, then we should be good throughout, right? This isn't always how it works out. There are many relationships that after a perfect beginning, start to go downhill. As with every relationship, people start to, start to argue and some issues come up. But unlike with our frog, something else happens. We don't break up with them. We've been with this person for a while, and so we either believe or want to believe that they're our soulmate. So going along with the same belief that being with a soulmate should be effortless, these issues are met with denial, internalized frustration, and even the neglect of the relationship. People who believe in this are less likely to want to talk about or even address any of their issues. Because again, admitting that you're fighting is like admitting that you're not soulmates. Additionally, once you've been with someone for a while, your relationship becomes a sort of investment. You've put time and effort into it, and you don't want to give up on it yet. This is called a sunk cost trap. And it might sound romantic. I mean, you don't want to give up on your relationship yet. However, this, mixed with not wanting to talk about your problems, means it can lead to staying in a relationship for all the wrong reasons. In case you hadn't noticed, believing in soulmates actually isn't all that romantic. Unfortunately, a lot of us still think like this. So what can we do to combat it? The biggest thing that you can do is know about the issues before you get into a relationship. Beyond that, once you're in a relationship, it's just important to know that everyone is human. People do fight, and that's something you need to talk to your partner about. Beyond this, well, Every once in a while, whenever you can, step back and self-evaluate. Ask yourself why you're with this person. Is it because 
They make you happy to be around them because you couldn't imagine being with anyone else? Or is it because you don't really have any other options to be with anyone else? Because they used to make you happy or because you're used to being around them? These questions won't tell you too much about whether or not somebody's your soulmate, but they can give you insight into whether or not this is someone you'd want to spend part or even the rest of your life with. Now, I know that almost everyone in the audience and myself are students, and so some of the things I've talked about might not apply to us as much. Namely, we're not really, or at least most of us aren't really, feeling in a rush to settle down anytime soon. Because of this, we have the time and resources to be a little bit picky with our partners. We can have a few failed relationships. However, this is a societal issue that affects all of us, regardless of relationship status or age. We've already touched on how the idea of soulmates perpetuates the idea that being single is bad. For some of us, it tells us that our one goal in life, or our main goal in life, should be to find a partner and settle down. We've also talked about how it can tell us to make lists or go searching for all the wrong things in the first place. It can cause us to break up with people early on or stay with them for too long. But all is not lost. Changing the way that we think about soulmates and the way we think about destiny is one small and relatively easy step towards a brighter future. As kids, we watched movies and read books about princesses waiting for their true loves, locked away in towers where only the most worthy men could get at them. Don't put up those towers. Be open to imperfect. Be open to a journey with someone. Just because there's no Prince Charming or Princess Charming that you're destined to be with doesn't mean that you're doomed to be lonely. It means that there are hundreds, thousands, or even millions of Prince Charmings out there that might do. It also means that you don't need a Prince Charming. So the next time you're worried about finding your other half, just remember that Plato had no idea what he was talking about <laughs> and that you are complete all on your own. Thank you.